probably are tired of seeing me, but anyway. Um, so, like I said, the purpose of this lecture is to talk to you about the ways of... Uh, uh, so, the uh, purpose of today is to talk to you about how the government works and why that relates to uh, transportation infrastructure in particular. Uh, and for some reason, I couldn't actually read the title. Okay, so transportation, something everyone does. Uh, there are, uh, on occasion, people who do the transporting of themselves and others a little bit better uh, than <coughs> others. Separated. 
Yeah, between the branches. Uh -huh. Between the branches of government. So there are three branches of government. Uh, we're going to talk at least about a couple of them that are relevant to um, transportation infrastructure. The second important thing to think about in terms of government and division of power is there's also a vertical division of power, which is federalism. And you're going to learn more about that because it's going to be super important on this topic. And you're going to learn more about that on Thursday. Um, so keep that in mind as you're kind of thinking about the ways in which a plan gets implemented or the way in which you could claim some sort of an advantage uh, based on the government structures, that there's this horizontal division of power in the government and also a vertical division. Okay, uh, it takes two to tango uh, and also to pass legislation. Uh, I'm going to try for another video. We'll see you know, where it doesn't work. If this one, at least, if it doesn't work, we'll um, be able to do it together.
process. And so I want to talk about the roles of committees, and this is going to be especially important when we talk about the jurisdiction of the Transportation Committee in both the House and in the Senate. Uh, by the way, the reason why I say it takes two to tango is, uh, well, why is, does it take two to tango when it comes to legislation? The House, the House and the Senate. Senate. Yeah, the House and the Senate have to pass exactly identical pieces of legislation. That's going to become important later when we talk about uh, important piece of legislation in front of the Congress right now about transportation. So, uh, roles of committee. Uh, committees are subgroups within the Congress. Every member of the House and every member of the Senate sits on multiple committees. These committees are the ones that do a lot of the legwork. Sometimes they're called little legislatures because they take items that the Congress is dealing with and they do a lot of the legwork. They do a lot of the investigating. They do a lot of the thinking about that legislation before it goes to the full floor of the House and or the full floor of the Senate. So these committees do a couple of things as a part of that legwork. The first thing that they do is something called markup. Anybody know what markup is? What would you speculate it is? Yeah. Editing, whatever. Yeah, exactly. So the markup process is the editing of legislation. So if I have a super awesome idea and I contact my congressperson about putting, say, a stop sign um, at a railroad crossing, uh, that congressperson would introduce the legislation, it immediately gets referred to committee, and then that committee edits the legislation. So if you introduce a piece of legislation, sometimes you totally lose control over it. Uh, because in the committee process, they could add in the word not. So your original legislation was like, increase funding for solar roads. Uh, and it gets to committee and it's instead, uh, they add in a not and make sure that we do not increase funding for solar roads. Solar roads, by the way, are roads that literally uh, are made of materials that collect solar energy and that can then be translated into electricity. I'm not making that up, people. Um, so, the markup process is really an important part of the legislative process because it changes the actual wording of the legislation. All right, second important role that these committees play is they can actually add amendments to legislation. What's an amendment? Yeah, like a change or an addition. Sometimes, this gets a little tricky, I'm no math person, but sometimes the addition can actually be subtraction. Uh, and what I mean by that is a member of a committee can propose a piece of uh, legislation that can get amended. That amendment can actually delete stuff out of the legislation, or it can add stuff to the legislation. Adding amendments in committee can sometimes be controversial because those uh, amendments often are what are called earmarks. Anybody know what an earmark is? So, um, yeah, so like an earmark is something that benefits the senators or congressmen's like personal district. Or yeah, exactly, yep. Yeah. So if John Cornyn, who's John Cornyn? Senator, Senator, Senator from Texas. So if John Cornyn is uh, introducing an amendment that's an earmark, it would mean that the money that had been allocated for that program would probably only benefit, well, definitely would, would only benefit Texas. So John Cornyn could go to a committee and say, committee peeps, I would like to add this amendment because Texas totally needs $1 million uh, to build a statue to me, John Cornyn. <laughs> Uh, and so that would be an earmark. It only benefits, well, really, John Cornyn, probably nobody else might want to look at him, but, uh, and uh, that statue of John Cornyn only benefits, right, the jobs that come from building the statue only benefit Texas. The, uh, the uh, traffic or the tourism that might be generated from that, that only comes uh, to Texas. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Uh, meanwhile, if you have questions or if you need me to repeat something, uh, you should definitely just be like, hey. Okay. <coughs> Questions? Alright, fine. Um, the next thing that committees do is that they actually hold hearings uh, where they bring in experts. So um, experts can usually come from several sources. Uh, these experts can come from within the government. So let's say the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee was holding a hearing on the transportation bill. And they wanted to bring in experts from within the government. What kind of people, or who do you think they would call up to try to get some experts? The DOT. So. Probably some people from the Department of Transportation. 
Okay, so somebody from the Department of Transportation. Who else? What other? Yeah. Okay, so it might be from some specific uh, subset of the Department of Transportation, which we'll talk about. Who else? Let's say that it was about uh, spending money and whether or not there was going to be economic benefit from increasing uh, road. So they definitely want to get um, some some economists inside of government, though. Where would those economists be potentially? Yeah. From the treasury. Yeah, potentially from the Treasury Department, or there's a um, executive. Um, Council called the Council of Economic Advisors. They might bring in people like that. So those would be some examples, right? So it's not just from the relevant agency that they would bring people in. It's also from other um, auxiliary or ancillary uh, departments that might be affected. Make sense? Second source of experts for congressional committees is um, outside of government experts from think tanks in particular. So outside of government, there are people who study stuff. Uh, I've mentioned to my lab, I may have even said to the collective that uh, there are a ridiculous number of outside think tanks and advocacy groups that are just dedicated to transportation infrastructure. Now, how you come while you were in college or graduate school to be like, I will study infrastructure. It will be awesome. I will make it my life's work. I don't really know how you come to that life path conclusion, but you know. But they like it, uh, and there's a lot of them. So um, those advocacy groups then might solicit Congress and say, hey, we have something to say about this. Or Congress might say, hey, Michael O'Hanlon from the Brookings Institute, you're so good at everything, come talk about infrastructure. Make sense? Okay, third source, regular people. I do not mean to insinuate that those other people are like robots or aliens or something, uh, but regular people. So let's say, for example, that um, you're, oh, this is going to be kind of like a downer example, but let's say that your family had been affected by like a car crash uh, on a highway. Uh, you could get invited by Congress to come and testify about road safety. Or let's say that you have a family member, oh, this would have been even better. Uh, so my brother works for the railroad. Uh, and he uh, could get invited to testify about railroad safety, for example, or the need to build a high-speed rail. Uh, they wouldn't really ask for that. But do you get the idea that it could just be like regular people? Do y'all know Michael J. Fox? Yes. Okay. So he's the actor who also has Parkinson's disease. And so he comes in and testifies like quite frequently about stem cell research uh, and whether or not the government should fund stem cell research because that's one of the potential treatments or avenues for treatments for Parkinson's disease. Okay, questions about the role of committees? Okay, so uh, in the House, on the House side, I should also say that the House and Senate maintain uh, essentially separate committee structures. So there are House versions of committees and there are Senate versions of committees. They do have a couple of committees that are uh, perpetually joint committees, meaning that uh, they are made up of House and Senate members. A lot of these are like non-controversial issues, like there's a joint committee on printing. That's right, I said printing. Uh, and so anytime the Congress wants to decide about printers, I guess, uh, they just like call up the joint committee on printing um, and they deal with that. House and the Senate, generally speaking, though, maintain, oh hey, oh nice, welcome. Oh, there's totally a seat right down here in front. Do you see how I'm trying to norm your behavior by shaming people who are late? Is it working? Hello, everybody. Hi. 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 Okay, so um, the House Transportation Committee, the official name of the House Committee is the um, House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. The chair of the committee is a guy by the name of John Micah. M-I-C-A, John Micah. Anybody know where John Micah is from? Yeah. Florida. Nice. Now, uh, we're gonna do this kind of throughout the lecture, but uh, how, why might it be significant, say for something that's occurring in November, for the fact that on our debate topic, the chair of the most important committee in the House is from Florida? 
Do you understand my question? Yeah. My question is, why is Florida important? It's a swing state. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I have to show you this because it's... Uh, the <laughs> 270 to win, uh, if you're doing politics stuff, uh, 270 win is awesome. Uh, and they've become uh, jealous, I think, of the 538 blog uh, on the New York Times. And so they really like fancified all the stuff and the information that they have available. So this is uh, 270towin.com is the website. This is uh, their assessment of Florida. Uh, and I, it's kind of only moving a little bit, but do you see this? Do you see how it's moving? Yeah. 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 That's cool. And so anyway, this is like an, a meter to say uh, how much it is shifting or not shifting towards one candidate or the other. The reason why Florida is also significant is that it gained two electoral college votes uh, in the most recent census. Uh, it is one of two states, Texas being the other, that gained more than one electoral college vote. So now it is not only a swing state, but it's an even more important swing state because it's got those two additional votes. Uh, and then it also, 270 to win also shows you um, different polling numbers um, and what the vote was in past elections. And then it also allows you to look at the population density in particular counties, uh, what the makeup of that population is, etc. Also, apparently in 1845, they helped the Whig candidate, Zachary Taylor, to get elected, which is important. That was, they had an election issue. Pardon? I think that's when they, like, miscounted the votes or something, so Florida would do something. Yep, yep. 2000 election in Florida is very, very important, uh, and uh, it went back and forth. Um, who won, who didn't. Eventually, Bush ends up winning the popular vote in Florida when the recounts stopped by about 534 votes total. And that swung the election uh, in its entirety. So, uh, and allowed him to get 271 um, electoral college votes. You need 271. That's just an aside. All right then. So, John Mike is from Florida. That's particularly important because. You can definitely, as we'll talk about in a second, make some arguments about why he would get um, some of the credit, potentially, uh, for that particular, any particular policy that went through his committee, which your plan would. Uh, and it also is significant because those are issues that are important in Florida uh, because they know things like John Micah is the chair. All right. The chair, by the way, is the highest ranking member of the majority party on any of these committees, the highest ranking member of the majority party. What political party has a majority of seats in the House? Republicans. Republicans. Um, so that means that John Micah is a what? Republican. All right. Ranking member. Uh, ranking member is an official designation. It's the highest ranking member of the minority party on the committee. Highest ranking member of the minority party. Uh, and so the current um, ranking member on the House Committee is a guy by the name of Nick Rahal, R-A-H-A-L-L. -L. Anybody know where he's from? West Virginia. No one cares. Okay. Um, so I'm going to show you the transportation. Uh, I just meant that. I'm sure that West Virginians care about West Virginia, but the rest of the country doesn't. Hey now. I'm sorry. Oh, are you from West Virginia? I yeah. am. Oh, okay, sorry. Also, Sarah cares about West Virginia. Yes. Sure. Uh -huh. is the ranking member. So he's like the highest ranking Democrat on the committee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And on these committees, the chair and the ranking member, they like collaborate about setting the schedule and stuff. Um, and so, yeah. Committees can actually be a place where there may even be some bipartisanship. As wacky as that is. I don't know, right? I don't know, right? Com no compromise. Okay, then. Uh, other questions? Okay. That was my sarcastic voice when I went, er, compromise. Did everyone hear it? No. Is that what voice it? What? Is that what is it? Always my sarcastic voice? No, no. Okay. Although some people think I need a bell. 
to ring every time I'm being sarcastic so that people know. You can do it, it's fine. We have much time to go. Okay, uh, I am going to show you now the uh, committee page. This can actually be relevant to you uh, for debate uh, because now that you are moving away from the magical Google searches, I know you are. You are. You can use the super awesome advanced Google and Google Scholar searches that you know, but no longer will you go to Google and say, Dearest Google, please provide me everything I need to know. Interesting. So one of the things that you can do is to go directly to the committee pages to get a sense of uh, what is happening. Uh, this particular page that I've uh, called up is a listing of legislation that the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure is thinking about. Uh, you'll notice that some of these things uh, have names that um, reference particular projects like the JFK Center Reauthorization Act, the Surface Transportation Extension Act, Part 2, uh, is another piece of legislation that this committee is uh, dealing with. Now, anytime you see that HR, do you see the HR and the numbers? Okay, you will know that that is, it stands for House Resolution. So you will know that it is a House bill. If you see S and a number, then it's a Senate bill. So HR means that it's in the House, and S will mean that it's in the Senate. So you can see, too, that um, like on this page, you can go uh, and see what the subcommittees are. I'll talk about those in a second. You can also look at the different staff that might exist. You can look at uh, op-eds that have been written by committee members. Uh, you can also look at the hearings. By the way, I should have said this a moment ago, these hearings are all transcribed, meaning that there's somebody who types out what's been said, and you can cut them for cards. I don't know. It's fun about Okay. Um, all right, so, this is the really like the reason you might be here. Why does this matter for debate? How could you use this in debate? We've already talked about how like in an election disad, you might be able to use it. They say to let the silence happen. Research. Okay, so you could do research. So now you know these committees exist and you can monitor them. All right. What would you potentially monitor them for or other things you were going to say? Uh, like a counter plan when they say that they want to do a plan and say it will be passed and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a really strategic way to use some of this. So, for example, if there is a house version of National Infrastructure Bank, and the plan does a Senate version of a National Infrastructure Bank, you could counterplan with the House version if you had a net benefit, which was a reason why the Senate version was bad. Do I need to say that one more time? Yes. Okay. So if the, just a second. So if the Senate, if the plan does the Senate version, your counterplan could do the House version if and only if you had a net benefit that was a disad to the Senate version. So if you've got something that Senate version does, you could stick it to the AF and be like, AF, you should have picked better. There is something about the Senate version that is really, really bad. Probably leads to extinction. I'm just saying. And so we should do the House version to solve the AF while avoiding human extinction. Thomas, is that good enough? There could be some arguments there, like if the that specific plan in the House or Senate didn't get passed, it's not going to come back revised and get passed there. Sure, let me be a little bit more precise. When I say the House or Senate version, it would have to pass both chambers, yeah. but fiat yeah. takes care of that. Okay, okay. Yeah? Uh, what if they don't specify whether or not it's, they're doing the House or Senate version? Yeah. Well, then you should run bill spec. International? <laughs> spec. I just intimated debate. Judges everywhere will thank me. Uh, I'm only being slightly sarcastic, so that's my like pseudo sarcastic voice. Uh, I think that you should, because there are, like on infrastructure bank, uh, there really are multiple proposals that have been proposed. Uh, and so you could make arguments about why the AF actually does need to specify which of those proposals they're actually advocating, and that there can't be a mismatch between what the plan does and what the solvency evidence is talking about. 
you should marinate in that and what I just said, uh, and then we can discuss it. Just discuss it. Discuss it uh, later. Okay. All right. Uh, so those would be some ways that that would help you in the day. All right. Um, jurisdiction of the committees. Uh, I want to show you uh, a little bit about this. Um, but not that. Uh, so, um, this is the jurisdiction of the House Committee. The, one of the ways you can evaluate jurisdiction is by looking at the types of subcommittees. Uh, you should jot down that a subcommittee is a subset of the broader committee. So if a committee has 33 people on it, then five people might be on a subcommittee that just deal with aviation or that just deal with highways and transit. So there are six of these subcommittees. It's one of the biggest committees in the House. There are actually 59 people on it. That's really pretty big for a House committee. Uh, and you can see that there is lots of things that the House committee has jurisdiction over, but it is actually nothing compared to the Senate's jurisdiction. So you can see that they're basically responsible for all of the parts of infrastructure and things that develop that uh, element of the infrastructure. Okay, um, all right then, Senate Committee. So you'll notice that the Senate Committee is actually even named differently. And this reflects a really expanded jurisdiction of the Senate Committee. So the Senate Committee is called the Senate Committee um, on Science, Commerce, and Transportation. Uh, as I have noted here, sometimes it takes 60 to tango, not just two. Why does it uh, take 60 sometimes? Anybody know? Hey, texting with texter. Mm -hmm. um, so, why does it sometimes take 60 in order to tango? Yeah. Does it take 60 to avoid a filibuster? Yes. So, the Senate, the House does not have this, but the Senate has something called a filibuster. How many of you have heard that word before? Okay. So, filibuster, F I L I. Buster. A filibuster is a procedural maneuver in the Senate that stalls debate and votes on a piece of legislation. Stalls debate and stalls votes on a piece of legislation. Are we looking at it Sometimes it feels like you're doing it in round. <laughs> No, you can't fill this around. You have a time with that. Indeed. And that is actually the reason why there is no filibuster in the, or I'm sorry, why there is a filibuster in the Senate. There's no time limits in Senate debate other than limits that the senators agree to themselves. And the reason why they don't often agree to those time limits is because they want to be able to filibuster. And this procedural maneuver is a way for the uh, members of the Senate, especially members of the minority, to stop legislation from getting passed and stuff. Does that make sense? Questions about the filibuster? By the way, if you are outraged about nothing in politics, this should outrage you. Used to be that filibusters, uh, if you were a senator and you were filibustering, you would stand up and you would have to talk. You'd have to start talking and keep talking. The longest filibuster, a guy by the name of Strom Thurmond, uh, really old, he's dead now. Uh, he was also a racist, although ironically after he died he came out he had a biracial baby. Uh, so, filibusters used to be that you would have to stand up and start talking, and you couldn't stop. You couldn't like go to the bathroom, you can't like tag team, you know, nothing. You'd have to like talk. So, Strom Thurmond, filibuster, uh, 24 hours and 11 minutes, 18 minutes, something like that. Yeah, so that means that he like started talking and then like talked literally for 24 hours straight. Okay, so here's where you should be outraged. To filibuster now, you just stand up and you're like, I filibuster. And then you get to like go about your business. You don't even have to earn your filibuster. Oh no, no, it's totally lame. Um, yeah. So like. Oh no, I know, you are stupefied by this information. Yes. 
So how did he do that? How did he do that? <laughs> Very carefully. Uh, he actually read, he was, uh, remember that racism part? Yeah. He was protesting federal government <laughs> involvement in housing desegregation. And so he read from the 50 state housing codes. But these like good kinds of filibusters, uh, you, where you have to like earn it. You don't have to say anything related to the issue at hand. So like you could like read Dr. Seuss. Now you might be shot on the floor of the Senate. I don't know, but um, yeah, it's a life story or yeah. Uh, long school. Yeah, long school. Because it supersedes all the rest of debate. So when somebody now stands up and says, I filibuster the transportation bill, it means that no other debate on anything else can occur. And it literally, it literally stops everything. Unless 60 senators vote for something called cloture, which is C-L-O-T-U-R-E, cloture. Cloture requires 60 senators. Uh, and it's the only thing that can end a filibuster other than the filibuster or like falling over. Does that make more sense? Okay. All right then. Uh, so yeah, that was a lot about the filibuster. Um, so there's still a, the um, committees are still important in the Senate. Um, the committees have to pay attention to whether what's coming out of the committee is actually going to pass a filibuster threat. Um, and so they have to make sure that what's coming out of them in the markup process, uh, as they're having the hearings to actually draft legislation, they have to make sure that that legislation could actually get past the filibuster. Okay? So this makes the job of the Senate committee a little bit more difficult. It's also, they have also have a much broader jurisdiction. So the chair of the Senate committee um, is a guy by the name of Jay Rockefeller, who has control of the Senate. Democrats. Democrats. So Jay Rockefeller is a Democrat. So this is a, a relatively um, unique feature in U.S. politics that you can have one chamber of the House controlled by Republicans and the Senate, the other chamber, controlled by Democrats. Uh, and so that's also, by the way, something to watch for in terms of the politics to set this fall is that there will also be congressional elections that are going on. All 435 in the House and a third of the Senate are up for re-election in November. So not only will people have presidential politics disads, they will also have congressional politics disads um, about who's going to retain control of the House and the Senate. So the Senate committee uh, chair does kind of the same thing as the House version. They direct traffic, decide the schedule, etc. Uh, the current ranking member is actually a she. Anybody know? Kay Bailey Hutchinson? Who's she? <laughs> She's the other senator from Texas, and so she is actually the ranking member. She is not running for re-election, which means that if the Democrats keep control of the Senate, the Republicans will have to select someone else to be the ranking member uh, because she'll be retired. Uh -huh. Who is the ranking member again? Kay Bailey Hutchinson. Right, and the ranking member is the minority party, uh, the highest ranking member of the minority party, so she's a Republican. You might have figured that out by the Texas party. Okay, um, I uh, would now like to show you some differences in terms of jurisdiction between the Senate and the House version by actually pulling out the right thing. Okay, um, so this uh, jurisdiction is like way more. Like their jurisdiction includes sports. <laughs> um, so one of the important things here to remember is that uh, these, the jurisdiction of the committees may give you some indication of, about the topic and what might be included as a part of the topic, but it's also the case that you know, some of these committees have lots of different jurisdictions that, just, that may not be related to transportation infrastructure. Um, you can see that they do have some things like inland waterways, um, uh, the um, Panama Canal, um, and uh, regulation of carriers, et cetera, and then support. Okay, um, this is a listing of legislation that they are considering. 
Apparently, they don't actually um, do a whole lot of updating of their website. Um, so it's, they've probably been doing other stuff besides uh, that. But if you look, for example, at, at the June listing, there's nothing. Uh, you can, by the way, look at that legislation, and you can also uh, look at the reports and the hearings as well for this uh, particular committee. Okay, they actually have seven subcommittees, um, which is a little bit more. It's smaller, obviously, because there's fewer members in the Senate. How many members are in the Senate? 100. 100, that's two per state. How many are in the House? 435. 435. All right. So, a uh, piece of prominent legislation that is currently being debated by the Congress is a transportation bill. Normally, transportation bills are not actually very controversial. Uh, we've had a lot of um, examples of transportation bills that have gotten, gotten through or hardly even makes the news. The transportation bill you should jot down is primarily focused on funding for the states on transportation infrastructure, funding for the states on transportation infrastructure. It actually expires, um, I, I'm pretty sure that this is right, on June 30th. Um, now, for those of you that um, pay some attention to current events, why do you think it's a big deal if the transportation bill doesn't get reauthorized? Summer recess. What? Is it summer recess? What? I'm sorry, summer recess? Uh, no, well, that doesn't happen until August, actually, when people go to the conventions where they like drop a lot of balloons and stuff. But why might it be a big deal? Who did I say the primary focus was on in the transportation bill? The states. The states, okay. So the states get a lot of their money to maintain like 35. To, how many of you drove on 635 coming from the airport? Or you probably didn't even know if you did or not. Okay, 635 is scary. Uh, part of the reason why it is scary is there is a lot of construction going on on 635. Some of the money to fund that construction is actually from previous allocations under the transportation bill. Okay? So, thinking logically, why might it be a big deal if the states don't know whether the transportation bill is going to get extended or not? Yeah? They won't build a, um, they will stop up the stop project, they won't build any more. Yeah, so they may have to stop it, right, if they like literally run out of money. What else? Yeah. Presidential election. What about it? Yeah, so it could affect that. But what's the other, what else related to construction might be an issue? Uh-huh. They might not have secure funding. Yeah, so they may have to stop it, but they also may not start the projects to begin with. Who builds roads? People, yeah, jobs, exactly. So this can also have an effect. So do y'all see how the like failure to reauthorize the transportation bill can have follow-on effects at the state level? States may have to stop or not start particular transportation projects, and that then may have an effect of not actually um, having jobs for people, et cetera. Okay? So it's such an expire on June 30th. Uh, they, the House and the Senate have passed different versions. Does anyone know? what the big holdup is, why this suddenly got all like super controversial. People start to like oppose asphalt. Is that why it's controversial, do you think? Yeah, there's that like very that anti-asphalt movement is really gaining a lot of traction. It's called Occupy Asphalt. <laughs> so I'll be there. That's my sarcastic voice, did you hear it? Yeah? Alright, fine. So what do you think has made, given what you know about the world, currently going on. What do you think has made the transportation bill controversial this time when it was not controversial before? Yes? Economic downturn and trying to be urged to balance the budget. Yes, money. It's all about the dollar bill, y'all. Uh, the money is the key holdup on this particular piece of transportation uh, legislation. So, um, the House and Senate have different versions. They're pretty radically different in terms of how they fund uh, the House is super focused on getting rid of earmarks. Apparently the other reason why this all got through before is because there were like lots of earmarks in the transportation bills. So they tried to strip it of some, uh, and the funding and how to pay for it is really the big controversy. The legislation is right now in conference committee. You should jot down that conference committees are temporary committees set up to iron out differences 
In legislation, iron out differences in legislation. There are temporary committees set up to iron out differences in legislation. So we talked at the beginning about how the House and the Senate have to pass identical pieces of legislation. Remember that? It was only like half hour ago. Remember that? Okay. So in order to accomplish that, where the House and the Senate pass the same version, if they don't do it on their own, then they create a conference committee. There are some other mechanisms to do it, but they uh, often will create a conference committee where people negotiate about the differences. Negotiations apparently go on like, all right, uh, and they think actually that they might be able to get to the um, changes that they need to make to actually iron out the different, the um, word, now under object. Uh, they think that they are going to come together and be able to negotiate out some of the changes, maybe by the end of this week. Um, and the reason why timing is important about those negotiations is that the House and the Senate have different ways that they like debate about bills. And once a conference committee comes up with a document, then the House and the Senate both have to vote on it. Does that make sense to everybody who's still listening? Okay, so it still means that the House and the Senate have to vote. And the way the House works is you gotta give people three days to figure out whether they wanna vote for it or not. And so, if it expires on the 30th, anybody know when the 30th is? Yeah. You lose all track of time, too. It's Saturday. Uh, and so, wait, 30 days past September, April, June, and November, yeah. So, uh, it's Saturday. And so, do y'all know that one? 30 days, past September, April, June, and November, 31 of all the rest, except like February, which is So, the process then of actually passing that conference report is gonna take a little bit of time. They think that they're gonna uh, be able to get to it. And I know that because I read Politico. Y'all ever heard of Politico? Okay, Politico is super awesome, most of the time. Uh, and they have like interesting stories too. Uh, and one of the things that I was a bit surprised about is they have a transportation law. I told you it's like mind boggling that people care about transportation. Um, so anyway, it's called Morning Transportation. It's a daily speed read on transportation and infrastructure. And as far as I know, they had this before this was the debate topic. No, I have this theory that in fact, the debate topic influences world events. It's a theory. Thank you. Um, it's a theory. Um, I wish I could make some comments. All right. So um, this um, this blog is a good way to keep track of what's happening uh, in the Congress and in the legislation. And so you can see, for example, Barbara Boxer uh, is a uh, senator from California, and she's apparently been in the lead on uh, these negotiations. And so Barbara Boxer has been sort of saying, yeah, you know, we're close. Uh, she has been using some football analogies about various yard lines and whatnot. <laughs> it's good times. Hey, okay. questions about the transportation bill? Okay. Um, oh, and when you're thinking about Congress and reading transportation blogs, sometimes, obviously you can't copy this down, sometimes you can also find like new apps. Apparently one of the controversial parts of the transportation bill is that some versions of it strip funding for uh, walkways and bike lanes uh, and would prevent states and local areas from being able to have bike lanes. Bike lanes on the roads with the painted lines and stuff, one might argue that it's transportation infrastructure. Okay. The executive branch, it's not all about Congress, uh, it is also about the executive branch. Um, that separation of power stuff that we talked about uh, divides the power across the three branches. The executive branch is super important because ultimately the executive has to sign legislation in order for it to become law. So, House and Senate have to handle a bond bill, and then bill goes to the White House, and even if everyone says yes to the bill, uh, the president can still veto it, or the president can sign it. And so the president is very important at that level. The other job of the executive, so that, those, by the way, are enumerated powers. Enumerated powers are powers in the Constitution. So in the Constitution, it says, president, sign, or veto. Questions about that? Okay, second type of power, 
another type of power the president has is called statutory power. These are also sometimes called delegated powers. Um, at the risk of the conversation taking an awkward turn, what does the word statutory mean? <laughs> yeah, in the law, in statute. So statute is a synonym for law. Okay? And so statutory powers are powers given to the president by the Congress. Statutory powers are powers given to the president by the Congress. And by the way, what the Congress giveth, they can also take it away. So sometimes the Congress strips the executive of powers, and sometimes they give the executive power. A lot of times the powers that the Congress gives are to implement other legislation. Implement other legislation. Uh, every time the um, Congress passes legislation, somebody has to carry it out. And the somebody are usually executive agencies. Executive agencies. Or departments. So, Department of Commerce, Department of Transportation. Hey, kids sleeping. Uh, the uh, Department of the Interior, which deals with like land and the environment and stuff. Uh, that is, those are all examples of uh, executive agencies and departments. Are you with me? Okay. Department of Transportation then is the one of the most significant uh, agencies or departments that deal with transportation infrastructure. It's like even in the name. Uh, anybody know who the head of the Department of Transportation is, Brendan? Uh, Ray LaHood. La uh-huh. Yeah, Ray LaHood. L-A-H-O-O-D. Ray LaHood. Uh, anybody know what is sort of unique about Ray LaHood's presence uh, as, the, as the Secretary of Transportation? He's Republican. Yes. And when did he start his job? The Bush administration. So Ray LaHood is an example of a department head. Secretary of Transportation that actually first was Secretary of Transportation under Bush in Bush's second administration, and he stuck around. Um, that doesn't happen very often, um, but it allows for some consistency in the cabinet um, and in implementation of policies and stuff. So Ray Lifted is, is a Republican, uh, and he was first Secretary of Transportation under the Bush administration. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether or not he always has to go to the State of the Union address. So, State of the Union address uh, occurs every January these days, uh, and it is a speech the President gives before the Congress. Are you all, all aware of the State of the Union? Have you ever watched it? Okay. Next time you watch it, because now you know it exists, uh, if you are a political junkie as I am, you can watch for the following. They make one of the cabinet members stay home. They don't get to go to the State of the Union. Because that way, if there was some catastrophe to befall the Capitol and everyone died, then there would be somebody who had a legit constitutional claim to being president. So I think the way that this works, and I'm speculating here, is that they all get together in a cabinet meeting and there's straws. And Obama holds the straw so you can't see the length of them. <laughs> and whoever draws the short straw gets to stay home. <laughs> and so I don't know it is. I don't know if Ray LaHood just doesn't get to draw the straw because they're like, you're Republican, we really if catastrophe befalls us, we really don't want you to be. I don't know. I don't know how that works. But next time you watch the State of Union, you should watch uh, who's missing, try to figure it out. It's a game. Yeah. Do you see Bowser Glass? No. Well, everybody gets Eastern Union, so the Secretary of Education ends up being the president. Oh, interesting. Well, there you go. Oh, I'm going to add that to my example list then. That's good. The way that it works, by the way, is uh, it's uh, president, vice president, president, first and foremost, speaker of the house, uh, cabinet in the order that that position was created. So that starts actually with the Secretary of State. Because although it was named differently, that is the was the first created and goes all the way to the Department of Homeland Security, uh, which was the most recently created uh, position or department. Okay, questions about any of that? Yeah. Can you go over the difference between enumerated and delegated powers? Sure. Enumerated 
powers are actually written into the Constitution. Statutory powers are given to the President by the Congress. Other questions? Okay, so, Department of Transportation. This is where it's at, and uh, I have decided now in my like day job, I teach some government and stuff, uh, and uh, I've decided I'm gonna use the Department of Transportation as an example of the complexity of the bureaucracy because there are a bajillion subsections of the Department of Transportation, which by the way is super awesome for a debate, and we'll talk about why it might be super awesome here in just a second. So, Department of Transportation, DOT. Uh, it is an alphabet soup. Jolly alphabet soup back in the day? So it is an alphabet soup of uh, it is an alphabet soup of bureaucracy. Uh, and what I mean by that is that there are a lot of different parts to the Department of Transportation. And I'm going to just talk in brief because I want to make sure to give you a break. Okay, so this is the Department of Transportation page, and um, the department is a reference to the overarching structure within each department, whatever the department is in the executive branch, there are agencies that are part of that particular department. So in my mental organizational chart, here's the Department of Transportation, and then all of these agencies feed up into it, and then beneath each of these agencies, there's other stuff that feeds up. I'm gonna show you an example of one of these organizational charts. So when I said that the Department of Transportation is like now poster child for complexity of the executive, it's because there really are a lot of subsections to it uh, that will be relevant to you for a bit. So first, you can see the Office of the Secretary of Transportation. This is sort of the um, hub of all the rest of the agencies. So this is the office that's primarily responsible for formulating national policy about transportation. How might that be useful to you in debate? What? I think somebody said it. Yeah, counter plan. They use the Congress. You just counter plan to like, you know, do the policy through the office of um, Secretary of Transportation. Run your elections to that as a benefit. All right. Um, a second uh, sub-agency is the FAA. A uh, bunch of other workshops uh, in the country uh, are writing airport apps that deal with something called Next Gen, N-E-X-T-G-E-N, -E Next Gen. Uh, and Next Gen is a national policy to upgrade airports and air traffic control. Uh, that is controlled by the FAA. The FAA is responsible in some part for the implementation of uh, NextGen. So there's a lot of good stuff that I've seen about the pace of NextGen being very slow. Uh, and that it's not uh, being implemented properly, and so it may end up being a big old waste of money. Uh, and so, like I said, that's definitely going to be an app. The FAA then may be the plan mechanism. So instead of having Congress do it, you could just have the FAA implement, you know, faster or something. Questions about that? Okay. Another uh, agency uh, within the Department of Transportation uh, is the Federal Highway Administration. What do you think they are responsible for? Highways. Yes. Okay, um, I'm not going to take the time to show you this, but I want to flag for you that if you're interested, you should go to this page and click on these agencies. And in particular, click on the missions of the agencies. Uh, what does the word mission mean? If somebody has a mission, what does that mean? Like, it's their thing that they do, right? My mission is to make you love debate as much as I love debate. That is my mission. Okay, so these agencies all have varying degrees of missions and, like, how complex their missions are. I'm not kidding. The Federal Highway, um, the Federal Highway Administration 
which by the way, I don't know why the acronym is FHWA, because I don't know what that means. This is their mission. Our agency and our transport to make our agency and transportation system the best in the world. <laughs> it's random. Like the rest of them are like a little bit more practical, but apparently they're idealists at the highway administration. I don't know. They want to like make it the best in the world. Seems like an unattainable goal. All right then. Um, so the uh, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. I think this agency is probably uh, slightly less relevant to the topic because it deals with the stuff that's on top of the roads. Um, but if you ever have to travel in a bus, they have a phone app where you can track the safety of the bus company, like an iPhone app. Okay. It is kind of cool, but it's also kind of random and may highlight that there are apps for everything, even stuff you don't need them for. Um, so, like I said, I don't think that this is necessarily as relevant as some of the others. Um, Federal Railroad Administration, I think it is definitely relevant. Uh, it was created in 1966, so it's one of the older agencies that are a part of the Department of Transportation, uh, and it is responsible for railroad safety and the actual like rails themselves. So this is an example of an agency where it's not only the stuff on top of it, but also the stuff you know that's actually the transportation infrastructure. And so that um, is, I think, going to be a relevant agency. Again, that can make it a counter plan, or it can make it a plan mechanism. You could just do the plan through uh, the agency. Okay, Federal Transit Administration. Uh, this one's really interesting to me because I, I was unaware that it existed. It was created uh, out of a piece of legislation in 1964, and apparently one of Kennedy's big things, or at least something that people said was one of Kennedy's big things, Apparently there were a lot of things that people, after he was shot here in Dallas, uh, people were like, oh, Kennedy totally wanted that. Um, and that was a way for them to like leverage it through the Congress. So apparently he was like big into urban transportation. Uh, and so this uh, particular agency got created in the aftermath of Kennedy uh, being assassinated because people were like, hey, Kennedy would love urban transportation. Um, and so a lot of these mass transportation apps, like the K uh, Lab is writing a mass transportation app, that's relevant, like this agency is relevant to debating about mass transportation because the federal government does get involved in mass transportation even though it is localized, right? How many of you live in a place where there's actually like good mass transportation that you can use? Okay, Dallas is not really one of them. It, it is kind of, but uh, the, the DART is awesome, but it goes like from here to here about. It's gotten a little bit. It's true, it's true, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I would have DART defenders. Okay, so anywho, uh, but the DART, which is the, the um, light rail system here in Dallas, it does not go to Phoenix, or Pahomix, as I call it. Does not go to Pahomix. Uh, so it is localized, but the federal government is still involved in it. Okay, uh, Maritime Administration. Um, what is maritime stuff? Water, yep. So ports and inland waterways are both important parts of this topic as well. Ports are the you know places on the coastal areas. Inland waterways, how many of you have seen the Mississippi River? Okay, it's like super big, ginormous, and a lot of your stuff comes down the Mississippi, right? We talk a lot about how we get products from like China and stuff. That's definitely true, but a lot of you know, domestic trade that goes on within the United States happens along the Mississippi. Uh, it is a shocking bit of information that I've learned, the amount that comes up and down the Mississippi, and apparently how crappy the lock system is. Y'all know what a lock is. So boat, you know, so on the boat, boat goes, it's going down the Mississippi, and then it, there's like a change in the levels in the Mississippi. So you gotta like, put the boat into the lock and then it kind of like moves it down to like the next thing. Some of you are cringing at my lack of scientific explanation of the lock system. This is generally the idea. So apparently that's all in like disrepair and stuff and um, Eisenhower rolls over and it's very, very periodically and stuff. All right. Um, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Again, I think slightly less relevant-ish. Uh, they investigate accidents. 
Um, that may be, I think, a decent advantage to the expansion or investment in some infrastructure because uh, congestion on the roads increases the likelihood of accidents. How many of you have driven along 35, like between Dallas and Austin and San Antonio? Okay, like it is like super scary uh, because there are ginormous 18-wheelers uh, driving around careening about uh, while there are cars. Uh, in Austin, the like on-ramps are like one car length. Uh, and so there's lots of accidents and congestion uh, may be an advantage, may also be a disadvantage um, as well. Okay, uh, Office of the Inspector General, uh, it was set up to monitor to make sure that people were like doing stuff right. So I think that there may be um, some, I think there may be something there. Yeah. I think that, or at the very least there could be some, I think that for some of these agencies, one thing to think about is you're like continuing to like develop the topic. Because by the way, debating a new topic is super awesome because you get to decide what it is. But one of the things to think about are sort of overstretched kinds of arguments. Uh, that if there's new plans that get implemented, for example, the Office of the Inspector General suddenly doesn't have the ability to surveil everything that that office needs to. Uh, and so that creates overstretch, which may create a trade-off someplace with something else that they're monitoring. So these are some things to think about. All right, Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration. There's a real debate to be had over whether pipelines are topical or not. I think there's a good defense of it is topical, part of our transportation infrastructure. I think there's a good defense that uh, it is not transportation infrastructure, it's energy infrastructure. Um, so that may or may not be relevant. Uh, RITA uh, is, I forget what it stands for, uh, Research and Innovative Technology Administration. Their page is chock full of like the next best idea in transportation infrastructure. And so you might check that out. I think that's a good place to be looking for some new uh, AF uh, ideas. The St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation is just uh, up in the Northeast um, and it develops the seaway. Uh, and then the Surface Transportation Board uh, is relatively new, and it's actually an economic regulatory agency. And so it um, is uh, important. All right, questions about that? Okay. Um, I have one other thing to say to you, and then you're going to get a break. Okay, I want to just flag this for you because I, it's going to be important. Um, issue networks. Describe the relationship between executive agencies, the executive, or I'm sorry, lobbyists and interest groups, and Congress. This used to be called the Iron Triangle, and the reason why it is important is because there are a lot of former transportation officials that go work for advocacy groups. Sure. Um, executive agencies lobbyists and interest groups, and then Congress. And so these um, issue networks, or sometimes they're called iron triangles, um, help to make transportation legislation potentially controversial, helps to make the implementation problematic. Um, this is uh, just one example of an advocacy group. And if you look over here on the left, there's a, a apparently working for this company the a former Secretary of Transportation, Chair of the Transportation Appropriation Subcommittee, Secretary of Transportation from Virginia, uh, the U.S. Department of Justice, Environmental Defense Part. So my point here is that even though a lot of what we talked about today deals with what goes on inside of government, those same people then go work outside of government and have an influence over government policy. Uh, and these are also the kinds of people that come up with good recommendations that could be like the latest and greatest app that you come up with. Because, like, you can change apps. Did you know that? Oh, that's right. What? I don't know. You can change apps. So what you start with does not have to be what you end with. Okay. On that radical notion, uh, you can have a 10-minute break. You need to be back in here at 10.30.